Both of our scriptures this morning come from the New Testament. We will begin with Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, the first chapter starting at verse 17. I invite you to hear God's word to each of us. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head of over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Our gospel passage comes from Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, also known as the greatest commandment. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we know what a steward is, someone who takes care of something that doesn't belong to them. So Christian stewardship, then, is we who take care of those things that belong to God, things that are not our own, like creation, like our bank accounts, our families, even our very own lives things that don't belong to us. We are caretakers of what we see in this world and what we experience. And we are asked to use them and treat them to glorify God. Now, if you tell someone on the street the definition of Christian stewardship, they'll probably think you're crazy. I mean, what? What what I've worked so hard for and earned all my life doesn't belong to me. I can't spend my money the way I want. I can't spend my time the way I want. I can't treat people the way I feel like it. What do you mean it doesn't belong to me? It's really a foreign concept, especially in our culture, that is so me and I oriented. And maybe that's why not only the world, but sometimes we as Christians struggle with this idea of stewardship, with the premise that all we have, that all we are, truly belongs to God, that we are simply caretakers of what has been entrusted to us. We struggle because from a human point of view, when we hear the word stewardship, it's often a really nice churchy cover-up word for fundraising, right? I mean, we got to pay the bills, and so we say the word stewardship, but somewhere in our mind, we're thinking, all right, this is another fundraiser 
just like all those organizations that call or the letters I get in the mail, just, just another group that needs money to do what they do. Stewardship is not fundraising. Stewardship is a spiritual discipline. Stewardship stems from our relationship with God. And really, it's, it's a matter of trust. I mean, it's really countercultural because what we're saying is that our security, our worth, our identity as people are not wrapped up in those bank accounts or in how we spent our time. But rather, we give that away generously to God's work through the church because we know there's something more, there's something greater that defines who we are rather than the number on our paycheck or the number in our savings account. It's extremely countercultural what it means to trust God. Stewardship, bottom line, is an act of faith. Faith that God will provide. Faith that I don't need to get more and more and more to feel secure or good about myself. It's an act of trust and faith in a God who loves us. Stewardship is a spiritual discipline. And while we often limit stewardship to money, it really applies to everything in our lives. I don't own my children they are loaned to me for a short amount of time for me to be a caretaker of them as I raise them the best of my abilities. They belong to God. We are caretakers of our very lives. And yes, we are caretakers of this church. You see, I've always had mixed feelings when someone uses that term, you know, my church, my church does this or my church that does that. I mean, on the one hand, it's a good thing. It means we are invested in my church, that, that we belong. There's a sense of ownership or responsibility. That's the, that's the good part of that terminology. On the other hand, my church can also mean I own it and it belongs to me and I want it to do what I want it to do. It exists to meet my needs because it's my church. So what happens when we think of my church as really God's church? And that we are just one link in this human chain of caretakers, of an institution, an organization, the body of Christ that really belongs to God. This church has been handed on to us from those who have gone before. And we will hand it on to those who come after us. And so in the larger perspective, we are merely a, a blip in this stream of human caretakers of God's church here on earth, doing God's ministry in this community. And so on this Stewardship Sunday, I'd like us to remember that we do not own this church. It belongs to God. We are stewards of something that does not belong to us. And so I invite you to turn with me to Scripture, to our Ephesians passage, as a reminder of who truly is the head of the church. Our Ephesians passage is such an uplifting Scripture. It starts in that verse 17, which reads, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, give you what? Give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. What a great prayer. I mean, who doesn't need wisdom and revelation, right? especially in uncertain times, especially in anxious times, especially in painful times, especially in difficult times. My prayer is that you would know wisdom and revelation, says Paul, as we boldly step into a future that is in God's hands. 
That next verse, verse 18, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among his saints? See, wisdom and revelation produce hope. Hope in a future that we cannot see. Hope that there is more to this world than what we see. Hope that those uncertain, anxious, painful, difficult times will come to an end. Hope that we are not alone, but that God is with us in this journey of life. Wisdom and revelation produce hope. And then it goes on in verse 22. And he, meaning God the Father, has put all things under his, meaning Jesus' feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church. Jesus is the head of the church, the one in charge, the one to whom all things have been given. Jesus is is who the church really belongs to. And it's emphasized actually several times in Ephesians and also in Colossians. Ephesians reads, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Colossians says, he is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is in charge, the head of the church, not the pastor, not the session, not the patriarchs or matriarchs, not longtime members, not new members. Christ is the head of the church. And that doesn't change. Members may come and go. The makeup of session changes every year. And yes, even pastors come and go. But the one in charge, the one to whom the church belongs, Jesus Christ, never ever changes. We are caretakers, stewards of that which belongs to Christ. And that does not change. What does that mean or how do we do that? Well, if we read along in verse 23 in that last verse, Paul writes regarding the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Our role is to be the fullness of Jesus in this world. That's quite a tall order. We represent Jesus. We are the fullness of Jesus. We bring his teachings and his message into this world. We are stewards, messengers of Jesus. As we were reminded, both at the stewardship breakfast and so eloquently by Henry during the announcements, we are family. We are God's family, stewards of God's church, and we are here to take good care of this church. The building, the people, and the ministry that has been entrusted to us for a short time. And yes, that involves our giving. It involves our resources. It involves our money. Because through our giving, we are proclaiming that yes, we will take care of your church, God. We will take care of your people and the ministry that's been entrusted to us. And so even though changes are on the horizon, which is a part of the rhythm of life, Jesus is still head of the church. God is still at work in and through us. And so our vision, our mission, the core of who we are and what we are about does not change. Who we are and why we are here is as solid and steady as ever. And as a reminder, I want to bring you back to Matthew's passage of that greatest commandment. Now, when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, that was not an easy question to answer. There were well over 600 laws and commandments of the Jewish faith, and he was asked to pick one out of 600 of them. Notice how the, the passage starts, that the, lower, the lawyer was trying to test him. So this wasn't necessarily a, a given 
answer. There was no main commandment, this overarching commandment over all of them until Jesus was asked. And notice he didn't just ask, he didn't just say one commandment, he actually responded with two, right? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This was the core scripture that your session took to heart when it created our vision statement in 2011. We came up with this phrase that hopefully you've heard it by now, which we thought was our vision and what we are about, right? Reaching out in love, loving our neighbor, because of the one we love. Loving God with all our heart and soul and mind. So we're reaching out in love through outreach and through Mulberry's Closet and through the Trunk or Treat and a, a comedy cafe coming up and the kids' Christmas event and all the things we do in this community. We're reaching out in love. But why? Not because we're another good, nice organization, but because we have a relationship with the Almighty God. Because we know who Jesus is, and Jesus asks us to go do that. Because of the love that we have for God that was first shown to us in Jesus Christ. We are reaching out in love because of the one we love. That vision, that commandment, doesn't change. It will always be the core of who we are about at Mulberry. So no matter what, whatever changes around it, the core of who we are stays strong. So in the midst of a, a search committee looking for a new pastor, in the midst of grief of saying goodbye in the next few months, in the midst of uncertainty, the core of who we are about doesn't change. So we take heart. This is Jesus' church, and it always will be, no matter what happens. And who we are does not change. We will continue to reach out in love because we love a God who has first reached out to us. And even when I'm gone, we will continue to find ways to reach out and to love and to love God as we come to worship together because Jesus is the head of the church. I want to leave you with a little encouragement that is actually very appropriate for this stewardship time. It comes from a very unlikely source. A random uh, young man in high school who just won a football game. But I want to listen, I want you to listen to what he says. And hear what he says about success. Hear what he says about hope and perseverance and optimism and a can-do spirit and a God that is always there for us. Would you play that, Kyle? Hey, Joaquin, I'm out here with Apollos Hester, wide receiver for the Patriots. You guys had one heck of a game tonight. Uh, how'd it go? I mean, it was going a little back and forth. You guys knew it was going to be a tough dogfight out there, and it was. So what were you guys able to do to come back and win this thing? All right, well, at first we started slow. We started real slow. And, you know, that's all right. That's okay, because sometimes in life you're going to start slow. That's okay. We, we, we told ourselves, hey, we're going to start slow. We're going to keep going fast. We're going to start slow, but we're always, always going to finish fast. No matter what the score was, we're going to finish hard. We're going to finish fast. Yeah, they had us the first half. I'm not going to lie. They had us. We weren't defeated, but they had us. But it took guts. It took an attitude. That's all it takes. That's all it takes to be successful is an attitude. And that's what our coach told us. He said, he said, hey, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. You're going to go out there. You're going to battle. You're going to fight. You're going to do it for one. You're going to do it for one another. Do it for each other. You're going to do it for yourself. You're going to do it for us. And you're going to go out with this win. And we believe that. We truly did. And it's, it's an awesome feeling. It's an awesome feeling when you truly believe that you're going to be successful. Regardless of the situation, regardless of the scoreboard, you're going to be successful because you put in all the time, all the effort, all the hard work and you know that it's going to pay off and if it doesn't pay off you continue to give God the glory if you still lose the game you continue to get each other's back and that and that's what we realized regard win or lose we realized that we were gonna be all right it was gonna be okay we're gonna we're gonna keep smiling it was awesome awesome the ball's always got a smile on his face talk about awesome. attitude this guy's got attitude awesome. you guys can't tell 
Uh, we met earlier this week, and uh, this was the enthusiasm I saw. It's the mindset. Yes, ma'am. Hey, you can do anything you put your mind to. Never give up on your dreams. Keep smiling. No matter what you're going through, if you fall down, just get up. If you can't get up, your friends are there to help you up. Your mama's there. Your daddy's there. God's there. Hey, I'm there to help you up. You're there. It's going to be all right. Just keep smiling, mom. Man. I mean, if that's not inspiring, I don't know what is. Right? All it takes to be successful is an attitude. It's going to be tough, but do it for one another. It's an awesome feeling when you truly believe you're going to be successful regardless of the situation, regardless of the scoreboard, because you put in all the time and hard work, and you know it will pay off. And if it doesn't pay off, you still continue to give God the glory, and you continue to have each other's back. And he goes on to say, that's what we realized, that we were going to be okay, that win or lose, we were going to be all right, you could put anything you put your mind to. If you fall down, just get up. And if you can't get up, your friends are there and God is there. This church, God's church, is in the midst of transition. But there are some things that do not change. This family of faith doesn't change. The vision, mission, and purpose, the core of this church does not change. And the one in charge, the head of the church, Jesus himself, doesn't change. So continue to believe, continue to be inspired, continue to give God the glory. And when you fall, continue to look for your friends and for God to help you back up so you can get right back in the game. Stewardship. God can do it, and you can help. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.